Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Unsan Chitta. This is what I heard. Guy wakes up in the morning, gets dressed, goes out and has breakfast, comes back, cleans up a little bit, and then goes to work. Sound familiar? We pretty much do it virtually 250 or so days per year. If you work in America with your big two weeks of vacation every year, what could be more mundane? What could be more regular? What could be so seemingly inconsequential? And getting up, getting dressed, having breakfast, washing up, and then going to work. Doesn't sound like anything. However, we need to figure out what our true job is. Sure, it's easy to go out and, you know, do whatever your employment is and get a paycheck at the end of the week. And then you have a roof over your head and food on the table and so on and so forth. But that's rather micro as opposed to macro. The Diamond Sutra talks about a lot of things in terms of the two truths, absolute truth, relative truth. Relative truth is that you know, I wake up in the morning, I have breakfast, and I do whatever it is my job is that pays me a salary at the end of the week. Um, same thing with you. You don't go to my place of employment, and I don't go to yours, and it works out much better for everyone. The thing is, the absolute truth in terms of what the Diamond Sutra teaches us is about the emptiness of those concepts. Reifying job, reifying car, reifying uh, money, whatever, that's all in the relative. That's not necessarily the absolute truth though. And sometimes we give short shrift to the absolute because there are too many arguments that can be presented. Of course, it's my job. Of course, it's my car. Of course, it's my wife. Sounds like a talking head song should be playing in the background now, but we'll let that slide. The absolute truth is basically that unity of all things. Yeah, there are things that we do great. That's convenient. That's relative. In the absolute the you that goes to your job and the I that goes to my job, no dividing line. Right? And when you hear things like, we are the world, or, you know, make me one with everything, or some of those, those other statements that, that deal with the absolute, um, a lot of times they can sound kind of like Zen 
greeting card, new agey woo. Uh, and here in the US in 2022, it seems like we kind of want to shy away from from that a little bit. It's almost like it's a little embarrassing. It's, you know, uh, I can't I can't talk about that without saying, but it's okay because I'm me and you're you. And when you get down to it, yes, in the relative conveniently, that's true. But the lack of that division between all sentient beings is also true. And the thing about the absolute truth and the relative truth is that the relative only manifests itself through the absolute and the absolute only manifests through the relative. They're not even two sides of one coin because that would imply that there are sides and there aren't any. Diamond Sutra says things like, all beings are no beings, thus are they called beings. That's the absolute and the relative right there. There's beings, relative. No beings, absolute. Thus are they called beings is what Zen Master Sung San might say is uh, 360 degrees on the compass of Zen, where form is form and emptiness is emptiness, and a being is just called a being. But what is it that these beings are supposed to do? These no beings, what are they supposed to do? In terms of their job, the big cosmic job. Let me read you a wee bit of the uh, Diamond Sutra here. Furthermore, Sabudi, in the practice of compassion and charity, a disciple should be detached. That is to say, he should practice compassion and charity without regard to appearances, without regard to form, without regard to sound, smell, taste, touch, or any quality of any kind. So, Buddhi, this is how the disciple should practice compassion and charity. Why? Because practicing compassion and charity without attachment is the way to reaching the highest perfect wisdom. It is the way of becoming a living Buddha. So, Buddhi, do you think that you can measure all the space in the eastern heavens? No, most honored one. One cannot possibly measure all the space in the eastern heavens. So, Buddhi, can space in all the western, southern, northern, above and below be measured? No, most honored one. One cannot possibly measure all the space in the western, southern, and northern heavens. Well, Sabuti, the same is true of the merit of the dis disciple who practices compassion and charity without any attachment to appearances, without cherishing any idea of form. It is impossible to measure the merit they will accrue. Sabuti, my disciples should let their minds absorb and dwell in the teachings I have just given. So now we're, we're getting closer to that. So what is my job? What's my job description even? What is it I'm supposed to be doing here? And even though at one point, the Buddha goes into how anyone who calls himself a bodhisattva is no bodhisattva. Anyone who thinks they're saving all beings is not saving all beings. Uh, that there are 
beings, there are no beings, and thus are they called beings. All of these seemingly paradoxical, maybe even contradictory points meshing together. When you get down to the thus are they called aspect, our true, true job as bodhisattvas is to save all beings, to help all beings. That's it. That's the gig. That's the job description. You know, clock in the morning, save all beings. Take your lunch break for the sake of all beings. Work in the afternoon for the sake of all beings. without saying anything about, hey, look at me, I'm saving all beings. Ain't I great? Just as Emperor Wu pointing out how much merit he must have had accrued by building all those temples and supporting all those monks when he asked Bodhi, uh, Bodhidharma about it, whatever was on his spreadsheet uh, was zeroed out. The clear button was hit, as it were, as has been said recently. So as soon as we think we're bodhisattvas, we're not bodhisattvas. As soon as we think we're saving all beings, we're no longer saving all beings. As soon as we think we're accumulating merit, there is no merit. That's quite a lot to swallow. However, it's only quite a lot to swallow if you think it needs to be swallowed. Why make anything? Why make saving all beings a thing? Why make merit a thing? They're all just concepts, they're all just words, they're all created by thinking. <clears throat> More from the Diamond Sutra. The Buddha continued, Sabuti, if anyone gave to the Buddha an immeasurable quantity of the seven treasures sufficient to fill the whole universe, and if another person, whether a man or a woman, in seeking to attain complete enlightenment, were to earnestly and faithfully observe and study even a single section of this sutra and explain it to others, the accumulated blessing and merit of the latter person would be far greater. Sabuti, how can one explain this sutra to others without holding in mind any arbitrary conception of forms or phenomena or spiritual truths? It can only be done, Subhuti, by keeping the mind in perfect tranquility and free from any attachment to appearances. So I say to you, this is how you should contemplate our conditioned existence in this fleeting world. Like a tiny drop, drop of dew or bubble floating in a stream, like a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, a flickering lamp, an illusion, a phantom, or a dream, so is all conditioned existence to be seen. Thus have I heard. At one time, the Buddha was staying in the Jetta Grove near the city of Shravasti. With him, there was a community of 1,250 venerable monks and devoted disciples. One day before dawn, the Buddha clothed himself and along with his disciples, took up his alms bowl and entered the city to beg for food door to door as was his custom. After he returned and eaten, he put away his bowl and cloak, bathed his feet, and then sat with his legs crossed and body upright upon the seat arranged for him. He began mindfully fixing his attention in front of himself. While many monks approached the Buddha 
and showing great reverence, seated the, themselves around him. The Buddha can get up in the morning, put on some clothes, have his breakfast, clean up afterwards, and go to his job, the job of saving all beings. So clock in. <laughs> <laughs>